been teaching a series, uh, an online series on truth to uh, Timothy O'Sullivan's. And then I've also uh, been teaching in cross class, actually. We were doing the life that wins, and, uh, and I, I felt the Lord lead me on this. I've never, there's certain truths that you, that you see, and there's certain truths that you see that I've never felt like I taught very well, and I never felt like I got the truth across that the Lord, at least not in the way or uh, in the importance carrying the weight that I felt like the Lord wanted it to carry. <clears throat> I think one of the most misunderstood consequences of the fall on humanity is identity. I think it's very, <clears throat> very understood and very little taught. Uh, I noticed, I did notice today that uh, uh, Gabriel Swagger has been teaching on identity uh, to his young people. But I don't, you don't find it taught all that much, at least not from the perspective of the cross. And, uh, and so I want, I want you to turn your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 32. I believe that identity, <clears throat> what is identity? Identity is what I believe about myself. Now, some of what I'm going to teach you uh, tonight, not in the sense of that I know more than you do, but uh, from what the Bible teaches, I don't want that to sound. Anyway, um, I want to say this, though, that I believe this is one of the most important things, uh, like I told the Timothy House students today, many people, I think, come to the end of their life very angry, very frustrated, uh, because they did not know what controlled them. And they did not understand coming to the end of their life. Uh, they knew that something had a, had a power or control over their life, and, and yet not knowing what it was. Uh, not knowing why they never accomplished what deep inside they believed they could or believed they were called to. And many people ending their life, um, you know, very damaged, very frustrated because they did not, again, as I said, did not understand what controlled them. And I believe that what, for many people, is identity. Identity, again, is what you believe about yourself. I know that, you know, this sounds psychological, uh, psychology does understand to a degree a lot of what I'm going to minister tonight, but their idea of healing, their answer and our answer are just a world apart from one another. Identity, the best, or excuse me, psychology, the best it can do is to diagnose you. Now listen, I don't want any gospel preaching never makes you turn inward. There's no, there's no answers you turning inward, trying to examine yourself, yeah. trying to figure yourself out. Amen. There's only more trouble in that. Yeah. What this is hopefully causes you to do is to look away from yourself to the only answer there really is, and that's the cross of Jesus Christ. Jacob's wrestling match with the angel, Genesis 32 and verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Of course, we know that man was actually an angel. It was not the Lord, and we know it wasn't the Lord because this angel would not allow Jacob to worship him. If it had been a pre-incarnate revelation of Christ, then he would have allowed Jacob to worship him. But he said he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. I want to say some things right there. The, the inference of Jacob being alone says this. The problem in your life and in my life is not who we married, who we divorced. It's not our boss. It's not society. It's not your skin color. It's not your level of education or lack thereof. America is becoming full of blaming. And it's the most dangerous blaming. It's one of the most dangerous things you can ever do. God will never, ever, ever lend His power to somebody that is blaming. Certainly, certainly there are people that have a level of responsibility for who we are and what happened to us and what we became. But in the end, the thing that where God is different than every other human authority that doesn't know God 
is that when you and I stand before him, once we reach the, reach, reach the age of accountability, you and I will not be able to point the finger at anybody. Not an unhealthy parent, not an unhealthy authority, not an unhealthy pastor, not anybody. We will stand there and we will, you know, literally, I want to say something to you. A lot of people think that when they die, and they go to hell or heaven, uh, hell in particular, but well, that's going to wake them up. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually says that people will stand before God and tell God that he's not telling the truth. You know, they say, but Lord, Lord, did we not? And they will argue with God at his very throne. Because even an encounter with God after life is over, when it's not resulting in the power of the sin nature being defeated, even that will not change. That's how deeply embedded in you your point of view can become. It's dangerous. We, we look around our culture. I was reading today, I shouldn't have, but I was reading today an argument uh, about some of these, about Colin Kaepernick, uh, his bowing a knee at the, at the national anthem. I was reading another conversation uh, about some of the police shootings that's, that we've seen. And reading through comment after comment after comment, I thought how hopeless our nation is becoming except for a move of God. And what I mean by that is that you're not going to be able to reason with a lot of people. They've already decided where they're going to stand. And they've already determined what they're going to believe. And whether it's good or bad. And uh, But what I want to say tonight is the Bible says that Jacob was left alone. When push comes to shove, when you and I uh, come to the end of whatever arguing, blaming, anger we may have, it's just us and God. And Jacob, if you know the context of the verse I'm reading you, you know that 20 years before, Jacob had cheated his brother out of his birthright and blessing. We don't know. We know there was a prophecy when Jacob and Esau were still in the womb that the elder would serve the younger. They were twins. And we don't know how God would have done that, but we know God would have done it without cheating and lying. And, and, and nowhere, please don't believe that just because the Bible records a story that God approves of. God did not approve of what Rebekah and Jacob did to Esau. It simply records what was done. It does not approve of it. God didn't approve of that. Somehow God would have brought that prophecy to pass without that happening. If, if Esau had not found his way out of that by the grace of God, his father uh, one of the few times that Isaac in the scripture really speaks prophetically and maybe the only time that he actually spoke a word of any kind of reproof and direction, at least that's recorded to his son Esau. He said, when you have finally come to the end of this, you will cast his yoke off of you. And had that not, had Esau not somehow gotten the yoke that Jacob had placed upon him off of him, it's very possible Esau would have killed himself. Esau would have become a, a, a destroyed man and Jacob would have been responsible for what he had created, at least partially responsible. As I said, in the end it would have been Esau. But, but Jacob now is called 20 years later to answer, to confront, to go back and confront Esau. Please don't think for a moment that just because somebody's not saved and you are saved, that God is going to let you get away with treating them in a way that's not Christ-like. That's not going to happen. Brothers and sisters, it is appalling when somebody that calls themselves... I was, I was telling you this, that I was listening to a black man, colored man. It was the son of another, obviously, another colored man. But they were born in um, Forsyth County, Georgia. And back in 1912 in Forsyth County, Georgia, there was a woman and her daughter that were raped and murdered by some black men. The reaction in Forsyth County was not only lynching, but they drove all 1,094 black people that were in Forsyth County. They drove them, physically drove them off of their property, uh, made them surrender their homes, their livestock, everything, shot most of their animals and forcibly remove them from Forsyth County, Georgia. It wasn't until the mid-50s as uh, Atlanta, Georgia started to grow that 
that black people uh, made their way back into Forsyth County. And the man I was listening to, his father, at, at one time was a Methodist preacher. And uh, his family was one of the first families that moved back to Forsyth County, Georgia. And he talks about how that white, now obviously there's two sides to every story and I'm not trying to you know, get into this thing that's going on in America, but uh, he got into, he talked about the way white Christians treated his parents. It was so bad, and, I know, and again, this man will ultimately have to stand before God on his own. But at the end of the, he talked about how that when he was younger, he said, when I sat and listened to my dad preach, he said the hair would stand up on the back of my neck. And he, and he talked very calmly and very admirably, admirably about his dad and even about Christianity. And you could tell when he was talking that this man was going back to very fond memories of growing up in the church. And the lady interviewing him, she said, uh, where are you as far as religion today? And he said, I, I lost my faith. He said, I'm, I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm an, or I can't remember if he said atheist or agnostic. And he said, uh, she said, what happened? And he said, well, actually, uh, or she, she made the statement, she goes, how does your preacher dad feel about that? And he goes, well, actually, my dad lost his faith before I did. And his dad was so disillusioned with the way Christians could treat one another that he walked away from God. And, and I'll tell you something, many times we don't take seriously how we affect other people. And, and I, that, was, that struck me that, you know, even in, even in what we're in today, I don't, I don't post things on Facebook. You know, I, I pray to keep my emotions intact. I pray to keep my, you know, my mind and my heart out of the battle that's going on in our country because what our country really needs is prayer. Yeah. And uh, what we really need is Christians to really get before God yeah. and pray yeah. for our country. But anyway... Jacob is left alone, verse 24, and it says, And when he saw that he not prevailed, and, and, I'm sorry, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Let me just say something. You and I ultimately are not wrestling with life. We're not wrestling with what's happened to us. We're not wrestling with another person. We're not wrestling with a memory. We're not wrestling with the past, the present, or the future. We're wrestling with God. Ultimately, your wrestling match is with God. Please hear me. There is nobody that's going to get out of this life without warfare, without a moment of wrestling. I just want to say something that it says, And when he saw that he had not prevailed against him, that's speaking of the angel, God is trying to defeat you. God is trying to get you to yield. I don't mean defeat you in the, in the sense of you, want, you being defeated, but in the sense of you yielding to God. Listen, your, your answer and my answer is to yield to the Lord. And the Bible says that when he saw that he was not prevailing, he touched the socket of his thigh, so that the socket of Jacob's thigh was dislocated. Now listen to what happens in verse 26. Then he said, let me go. This is the angel speaking. Let me go for dawn is breaking. But he said, I will not let you go until you change me. It says blessed, but that's really the meaning. I will not let you go until you change me. Now, I want to say something, that what happened in this wrestling match is once... The angel touched uh, Jacob's thigh and his, his hip socket went out of joint. Now the Bible goes, it says that Jacob went from wrestling and fighting off God to holding on to him for dear life. See, God wants to weaken you in some way until instead of fighting against God, you're holding on to God for Amen. dear life. Amen. You know, God really wants to bring you to a place where, where you're helpless yes. so that you'll lean on him. And, and so that you'll trust Him. And so that God can begin to bring direction to your life. And I'm getting to something. And it says, I will not let you go until you change me. Brothers and sisters, listen. You and I need changed. And I, and I mean from the inside out. We don't just need behavior changed. We need identity changed. We need what we believe about ourselves. One thing that I find, and, and I think this is true in our day, maybe more than generations before us, is that we don't realize how deeply affected humanity was by sin. You, we do not realize how deeply the sin nature affected everything about us. Everything about us. 
has been altered because of the fall and the, and the grasp of sin, and the sin nature upon humanity. And the Bible says sometimes you just think, you know, until God really deeply deals with you, sometimes you think, well, I just need a behavior change. You know, my walk with the Lord, uh, especially in the last two or three years, there's been able, God's been able to identify things in me that needed to be changed that I couldn't even see two or three, four or five years ago. I couldn't even see it, let alone change it. I couldn't even see that that needed to be changed. Motivation, you know, when I look back over my ministry, I hate to say this, but I don't know what really motivated a lot of years of my ministry. I'm not sure that I wasn't motivated more by God wanting to make me or me wanting God to make me look good as opposed to me wanting to make Jesus look good. I'm not really sure. You know, so often the motivation in Cindy and I were talking about a circumstance uh, before church, and I'm obviously not going to get into it, but somebody was supposedly, quote unquote, warning somebody else about a certain situation. But the truth is, I think, and I think once I heard about it, I think I'm right, they weren't really concerned about the people they said they were warning. They were really more gossiping. And many times, listen, you can have things going on in your life. You can't even locate the motive. You can't even, you're not even sure of what the problem was with you. Why you did that, let alone change it. And I'll tell you something, the, the, the one thing that I have found, I was telling somebody, somebody asked me a question. They said, what do you think led to your sin seven years ago? And I said, I'll say this. There was a lack of revelation about myself. I think one of the greatest things God does is God shows you your own heart. You know, when people come to you and say, Pastor, God's been really speaking to me about so-and-so. You know, really, more than likely, God really doesn't want to talk to you about so-and-so. God wants to talk to you about you. Amen. The hardest person, let me know that, the hardest person to properly see in your life is your own heart. In fact, you'll never see it without the help of the Holy Spirit. And you'll never be able to own it and deal with it without the help of the Holy Spirit. So he says this. He said, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Now I firmly believe at this moment that Jacob, for the first time in his life, came face to face with his own brokenness. Now when we read this, we don't really get the import of what actually was happening here. What, when, when God said, Jacob, what is your name? Jacob... If you read when he shenaniganed his brother, his brother says something. Esau says, was he not rightly named? Why did he say that? Because Jacob means deceiver. Jacob means surplanter. It actually means that somebody that will come up. You ever had somebody, this is, people think it's really funny, but it's extremely irritating. You ever had somebody come up and kick the back of your foot when you're walking so that your foot goes into the back of your foot and you end up tripping? That right there is a, a, a definition of surplanter. It means to come from behind and trip somebody up. When, 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 listen, I believe Jacob always thought, to this point, Jacob always thought his name was just a name. But at this moment, he realized that it wasn't just a name. It was who he was. I'm going to tell you something. The power of the Holy Spirit, and, and I, the Holy Spirit is going to have to let this sink into your heart. You'll never understand how deeply you need Jesus until the power of the Holy Ghost really comes on your life. Yeah. You'll never realize so many people... It took many years for me to realize. I think about this all the time. I tell the Lord this all the time. Lord, I don't care if I pastor. I don't care if I'm a leader. None of that matters to me. If you've done nothing more, you saved me from myself. You saved me from what I should have been, what I would have been, what I could have been. When I look at people, when I, look, when I hear their stories, I'm always thinking in my own heart, I'm thinking, Lord, had you somehow not got a hold of my mind and my attention, that is who I would have been. I would have been that man. I would have been that circumstance. Yeah. That would have been me. Yeah. Yeah. And brothers and sisters, I'll tell you something. It takes the Holy Ghost to make you truly appreciate what God has done and make you realize what you really were yeah. without Christ, what you really were capable of. I was talking to Ray and Laura 
Last night they uh, got left without a bus ride down in Okanagan, and so when I went down and I was going to visit, I, I visited Eugene anyway, so I, I brought him home, and, and Ray told me some stories about, uh, I didn't know this, that he has, he has two children, and uh, they, were, they were from uh, before he got saved, and, and, uh, but the one, his daughter, her mother, uh, got into a, a bad stint in her life, became a drug addict, and uh, ended up, uh, was going to California, taking four pounds, of course I'm repeating Ray's story, four pounds of cocaine uh, over the, over the Cali uh, Oregon, California border, and was taking their daughter, her daughter was seven or eight years old, their daughter was seven or eight years old, and, and taking their daughter out of state, he said, I didn't know she was leaving with her, and, and uh, so anyway, across the California line, their little girl started crying, saying she wanted to go home. Uh, his ex-wife pulled the car over her, 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 her boyfriend or her stepdad or whatever he was, pulled the car over and said, fine, get out. And I don't know if you've driven to California before, but just as you go past Mount Shasta, that's where they dropped her off. Oh, no. And she was on the side of the road, a state high, uh, California highway patrolman uh, came by, saw the little girl, her little brother, standing on the side of the road, uh, picked him up. He ended up calling Ray. They ended up flying him back to Washington State. And the lady ended up going to prison. She ended up being sentenced to prison for 12 years. Wow. She went to Purdy, and in Purdy Penitentiary, uh, she hung herself. They found her hanging in her cell and killed herself. And I often think of... You know, and I know that's an extreme example, but I often think of where people's lives end up, and I think, God, if you had not come into my life, there's nothing I could not, there's no future that possibly could not have been me. Because when you read and you hear and you listen to people's stories, the things they've been through, the things that have happened, the things that were beyond their control is, is unbelievable sometimes. So, and it says, and he said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men, and you have prevailed. And now listen, Israel means this. Israel means that you'll have power with men and with God. And at this moment, there's, God did, God did give Jacob the key to dealing with Esau. He didn't give him money. He didn't give him an army. He didn't give him anything. He gave him a new identity. Because when your identity is renewed, when your identity is healed, everything else will follow that. One of the things that, that directly, I feel, directly goes back to Jacob's healed identity is that when he finally encountered Esau, he could bow to him. He could admit he was wrong. Seven times the Bible says that Jacob bowed in front of Esau. And I'll tell you something, how many people have relationships that have never been healed because they cannot admit they're wrong? They cannot say they're sorry and really mean it. They cannot bow to somebody else and just say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for what I did, I'm sorry for how things went, I take the wrong upon myself. I'm able to own that. You know, I, I think, of, I look at our culture and I think of, of these kind of things that are getting so difficult. Now listen, I know you don't live where I live. But I'm telling you something, in 22 years of pastoring, I've never seen it harder for people to admit they're wrong. I've never seen people want to blame other people for where they are more than right now. Never. Never have I seen it. Pointing fingers at leaders, pointing fingers at family, pointing fingers at friends, pointing fingers at the church. Uh, you know, I'll tell you something. I, I've just come to a place where I was talking to somebody the other day and we were, we were discussing a situation and I said, look, you know, I said, as far as I'm concerned, they just have to go. And I said, because the church is not going to be blamed for where they're at. I won't let the church anymore be the whipping post for their, where they're at in their life. I'm not doing that anymore. I said, I actually feel like I would be in sin to go try to chase that person. That That's person right. needs to come to the end of blaming people and finally take responsibility for who they are and what they've done. Yeah. And until that happens, they're not going to have victory. And I said, I wonder sometimes, even in my own ministry, I wonder how much I'm going to answer sometimes because I wanted to get somebody back in the house of God without repenting. Yeah, 
Right? Yes. Well, I'm going to tell you something, brothers and sisters. I've been through a rough year. And, and I've learned some things. I've had to get before God this last year and examine my own heart and say, some of the, some of the same things we've been through have been my fault. My motives were wrong. My, my eyesight was wrong. I, I went to my eldership and, and, I, and I've, I've leaned on him more about decisions with people than I ever have before because it's made me not trust myself. And I've understood there's been some things that have been deep down in my own identity that were not healed and God needs to deal with some things in myself. And so let me just tell you, or let me just get to some things. So I wanted to establish the truth of identity. What you believe about yourself. Listen, I believe actually it takes the Holy Spirit to even show you what you believe about yourself. Many times we disguise what we really believe about ourselves with good times that come and go. We, we try to disguise it in the things that we do for a living or how much money we make or a title that we hold or whatever. And we, try to, and we really try to get away from what we really believe about ourselves. Let me just say something. So much of your behavior will be unexplainable until you understand identity. When I, when I had my problems, seven, not that I don't still have problems, but I don't have problems like that anymore. And I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about how soundly God has healed me. And that so many of the voices and the impulses and the things that I used to struggle with seem so foreign to me now. Because, I, because God has so soundly quieted and silenced those things. And so soundly, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying they, that I'm beyond sin or I couldn't, you know, be a fool. I could because I'm human. But so many of the things that I struggled with for so many years, I can't, I can't imagine that anymore because it's been so soundly healed in me. And it's not been me that's done it, it was the Lord that did it. In fact, it was almost an unconscious I think every true victory is an unconscious victory, meaning that you're not purposely trying to make it happen. Yeah, it's, it's grace and the, and, 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 the, and the Spirit of God is doing it, and you're the one waking up one day and going, whoa, I really am a different person. It's been however long since I even thought about that. I haven't even thought that. It hasn't even troubled me. I, we were talking in our small group Sunday night at my house, and somebody said you know, they were relating temptation to the smell of cookies. And how that when you smell a cookie, you've got a decision to make whether you're going to eat it or not. And I said, here's where I'm at. I'm at a place I tell the Lord, Lord, I can't even smell the cookie. If I even said, if I even, there's some things, if I even hear it, if I, if it comes to my mind, I'm already, I'm already in trouble. And the Lord's been faithful to me that I don't even smell the cookie anymore. You know, and it's not something I've been consciously doing. Please understand me. You can try to take control of your own thought life, or you can let Jesus can take control of your thought life, right? You know, right? Isn't that right? Do you agree with me? If you don't, if you don't agree with me, then be bold enough to say, Pastor, I don't agree with you. Anyway. So listen, identity is what you believe about, not what you think about yourself. What you think and what you believe are different. Thoughts come and go. What I think comes and goes, but what I believe about myself, that's what controls my life. What, what, I, what I believe about, it takes God to change what you believe about yourself. Listen, I told you this before, that I think identity, I've said this to the guys, and, and I want to say to you, I think identity is well explained by this little, this program I saw on National Geographic. And there's a little microcosmic or microscopic organism that is so small that it crawls through the ear openings on the head of an ant. And it will crawl into an ant's head and burrow through its brain to the set, to the part of the brain that controls its thought life, its decision making. Doesn't affect its motor skills, doesn't affect its breathing, keeps it alive, it can move, it can crawl, it can lift, it can do pull, it can do all that. But it controls the, the decision-making part of its brain. It keeps it alive, and it controls the decision-making. If you were to watch that ant, you would never know that that little microscopic organism is controlling all of its, uh, all of its actions. It doesn't even know that this organism is controlling it. Identity is much like that. 
Identity will be controlling your life. Your, listen, broken identity will dictate what you attempt. It will dictate who you're attracted to. It will dictate, uh, it will dictate almost everything about your life. What you believe, I'm telling you, what you believe about yourself is so affecting so many people and they don't even know it. They wonder, what in the world attracted me? Listen, Cindy and I have watched this all of our ministry life. You'll get a broken man and he's drawn to a broken woman. Why is he drawn to a broken woman? Because he's a broken man. Yeah. And he thinks that maybe because she's more broken than I am, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be superior. I'll be able to control. Women do the same thing. They're, a lot of broken women, they're not attracted to a healed man. They're attracted to a broken man. Why? Because identity says, I don't deserve a healed man. I deserve a broken man. So you get together with a broken man, then you're frustrated because all he can be is broken. That's what he is. He can't be what he's not. And, and I'll tell you something, identity, broken identity will be like somebody has their fingers in your nostrils dragging you into a relationship that's destructive and you're attracted to somebody and you don't even know why. Yes. And this is the power of what you believe about yourself. And if, you, if you're here tonight and say, Pastor, that's me, what do I do? Well, you don't divorce, let me just say that. You pray. You get on your face and you pray. And, and listen, a broken identity leads to infidelity. Why? Because you're looking for something to reinforce that you're masculine and, 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 you're, and you're good looking and, or you're beautiful. It's, it, it's, it's identity. And ident listen, broken identity will make you look like somebody you're not. It will make you look like someone I'll never forget sitting in front of Pastor Beebe, who is a dear man of God, a, a, a true man of God, a loving man of God. But I felt like a fool. And I didn't even know why I had done what I did. I knew I loved the Lord. I knew that I, I knew that I wanted to I knew I was sincere. But I did not understand why I had done what I did. And brothers and sisters, listen. Failure, God can turn failure inside out and make it the most wonderful thing in the long run that ever happened to you. When you fail, you have a choice to make. You can feel sorry for yourself or you can own it, get on your face before God and let God teach you things through it. Uh, uh, right? Listen, I, 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 these, the Timothy L. Skies, Rusev students, cross class, I minister more from my failure. Because I, I believe that's why God put fail, men's failures in the Bible. Because most of most of you and I, we can relate, if we're honest, we can relate to failure. Yeah. Yeah. And when you find out that somebody that you think is a true man or woman of God has had their own battles, now you can say, okay, well, if God can change you, He can change me. Yeah. Yeah. If, if God can do that for you, God can do that for me. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Come on. I can't tell you how many times, Sarah, I can't tell you how many times, young lady, that I used you as a testimony. And, and that's, that's what we're all about. So, listen, I do, what, what is identity? How is identity formed? Let me just tell you, it's formed by one of two camps. It's formed by the power of the Holy Spirit or it's formed by the enemy. There is no in between. Yeah. What you believe about yourself is either has been formed or is being formed by the power of the Holy Spirit or it's being formed by the voice and power of the enemy in some way. We don't know what it is. It can be a lot of different things, uh, but we know it's being formed by one of those two places. Let me talk about voices. You know that I preach often about voices. I believe in voices. I believe that Paul teaches us that all humanity hears voices. Those voices are ultimately from, again, one of two sources, God or the enemy. They're the voice of darkness or they're the voice of God. Listen, voices can be divided into two different types, internal or external. You either have internal voices. What do I mean? I mean voices that you remember hearing from the moment you could remember. I, I see myself all of the time in a little fort that was in the back of our house when I was five, six, seven years old. When we lived on Armour Road in Marysville, I remember the color of the house. We lived in a pea green, ugly house. I remember that house. But I remember that fort in the back of that. And I remember being five, six, seven, somewhere around that age. And I remember hearing voices. I didn't know it then, but I can look back now. Hearing voices that were already trying to tell me things about myself. 
Do you know this? Listen to this. This proves my point. Do you know that psychiatry says that your identity has already, most human beings, listen to this, their identity has already been formed by the time they're five years old. That proves. Now that doesn't mean it's unchangeable. Because you and I know God. Yeah. And the Bible says that God regenerates people. You know what that means? It means God regenes you. I don't care how genetically messed up you are. I don't care what life did you. I don't care what mom did, dad did, uncle did, grandpa did. I don't care what anybody did to you. Jesus did something better for you. Yeah. Amen. He died on a cruel cross and shed his blood that you and I can be changed. Amen? Come on. That's good news. That's good news. And, uh, but listen, so you got internal or external voices. You've got internal voices. Nobody ever said it to you. You just always heard it. Nobody, no human being ever said, and, and, and please understand me, one thing how you'll always know you're listening to a voice from darkness is it will never encourage you. It will never tell you anything good about yourself. It will tell you something bad. It will tell you you're not. It will tell you you can't. It will tell you you're just fat. It, it will compare you. Listen, uh, you know, when Paul said this, it's so powerfully true. To compare yourself among yourself is not wise, right? right? Because you know why? Because the devil always makes sure you compare yourself to somebody that's way lower than you, so you're proud, or way better than you, so you feel horrible. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to tell you something. Ladies, I want to say this to you. Don't you dare believe that every guy in the world only cares about what a woman looks like on the outside. That is not true. I'm going to tell you something. The, there are I, 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 see, I see women on TV. I see... Things, and I, I'm telling you, I think to myself, God, that lady, I know men think she's pretty, but that's the most broken mess. You want to talk about being a hot mess. She is a hot mess. I wouldn't be any more attracted to that than I would be going out and, I don't know, eating my dog's dog food. I, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to insult the person, but I'm just saying that, that that's not true. And women in our culture think that's all that a man pays attention to. That's not true. I'm going to tell you something. I, 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 the, the older man, if a man's a man of God, I'm, I'm, in, my, I'm in a pit here. I'm trying to get out of my If a man's a man of God, he loves a woman for a lot more things than that. Come on. I'm telling you something. The Bible says a righteous woman is like a jewel and a crown. Come on. Amen. Ladies, I'm going to tell you something. Don't worry so much about what you look like with makeup. Worry about what you look like in the presence of God and to the Lord. Worry about that. So identity is formed by internal voices or external voices. External voices meaning that people have come in your life. You look at the power of Jezebel's voice over Elijah. One woman's voice. And, and it can be a man. It can be anybody's voice. But external voices. Voices that have come through people. You know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I've cringed literally cringed in my spirit when I've heard men and women repeat what their mom and their dad said to them. Things like, you're worthless. You'll never be anything. You'll never amount to anything. I mean, my spirit, and I'm sure yours does, just cringes. And, I, and, and even when I look back, I, I was saying this the other day, I'm standing up, I said, there are sermons, if I could take them back, I've preached through the years, I would take them back right now. I would take them back so quickly because they were preached out of selfishness. They were preached out of me being more frustrated and wanting people to come to church and, and do things to make me look like I was a good pastor. And it wasn't out of concern for their life and their heart. So there's voices that are external. There are voices that are internal. There's voices, listen, that have come through people that didn't. most people do not, do not know they're being used of the enemy. Hear this. There's been relationships. Unhealthy relationships. I told the story to the Timothy House guys today of a young lady, a precious lady that was one of Cindy's first students at Ruth's house. Grew up in, in a, at least a semi-Christian home. She, she was pretty, lived in a pretty protected environment. Her first job was a job at a car lot. She went to work at a car lot and she fell in love with one of the car salesmen. And he was not innocent. He was a worldly man. He knew the ropes. He had been there. She fell in love with him. They ended up getting into drugs. They would have four children, all of which would be put up for adoption. 
all of them would be taken away from them. He would pro end up prostituting her for drugs. They had that bad a drug habit. He prostituted his own wife. She got into such deep, dark, demonic depression that she would drink hairspray. She would drink anything she could get her hands on. They, they would have to take hairspray out of Ruth's house because if she found a bottle of hairspray that had alcohol, she would drink it and inebriate herself. That man ended up putting a gun in his mouth, her husband, and blowing the back of his head off. But that relationship scarred her life forever. Today, she is still an alcoholic. She's never been able to escape the, the torment, the things she would tell Cindy and I, some of the things that he would say to her. And they echoed in her mind and spirit. You would talk to her sometimes and she would cry. I remember preaching in the old building and I would get to preaching and she would be, her, I'm not kidding, her face would be wet from one, one side of it to wet with tears. And I remember Cindy and I sitting down with her so many times and, and trying to pull her out of that hell. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, listen. I'm telling you some voices, it is, uh, you need to be careful about who you let yourself become emotionally invested in. Oh man, you couldn't teach that too much. Number three, identity is formed by environment, home life. Now listen, I know a lot of this sounds like psychology, but listen, a lot of psychology has certain things right. They just have the answer wrong. Amen. Environment is definitely an effect, has an effect on people's identity. When you grow up, when you grow up around darkness and depression and, and, and you grow up, you know, uh, around negativity and you grow up around fear and all of these things, they can embed themselves in your spirit. And here's the danger of it. You don't even know they're there. You can be around something so it's natural, it's common, and you, you can grow around, uh, you can grow up around, I grew up in a very fear-filled atmosphere. I didn't know I did. Actually, the first moment I really, well, really, the first moment I ever began to have an understanding at all about that I battled a spirit of fear was Pastor Keith. But the second time I understood the power of fear was when I sinned seven years ago. That's when I understood. I know nobody would believe that, but what happened to me was linked to fear. And there was such real fears in my life that I would go, I would drive, I would, it drove me to a place that was sinful and wrong. And I'll tell you something, brothers and sisters, you can grow up in environments, environments that make you afraid to step out, environments that make you afraid to give, an environment that makes you afraid, you know, to, to I don't know, be different. You can grow up around anger. You can grow up around a lot of things. You can grow up around brokenness. Environment has a lot to do with what you believe about yourself. Number three, failure. Failure has so much lasting effect upon people's identity. If you don't have, why did Jesus say, listen to this, why did Jesus say when you've gone to a city and you've been rejected, hear this, when you've been rejected, shake the dust off. What is dust? Dust is invisible particles of where you've been. <clears throat> listen, there's things you don't even know have clung on to you from failure in the past. You don't even know it unless God shows it to you. You don't even know. How many know? Come on. We all know this. You can, you know, we have this formal dining room. And sometimes when you're up close, you think, man, that looks really nice. And then the sun will come through at a, at a perfect angle. You go, that table is full of dust. Where has Cindy been? You can get back. But, but you know, that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying failure can implant invisible things in your spirit. Yeah. Listen, I'll tell you something. Most people that have, you know, I know you've heard me say this, Thomas Edison, they said he tried 1,000 or there about, uh, right around 1,000 formulas for the incandescent light bulb before he got one to work. Yeah. And when they came to him and they said, so it took you 1,000 times, you failed, 1,000 times to make the incandescent light bulb. He said, no, I didn't. I just found 1,000 ways the incandescent light bulb doesn't work. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you something. You'll very seldom find a man or a woman of God that hasn't had failure. In fact, probably never. They've had to fight through failure. They've had to fight through things. You know, this Pastor John's, I know we've kidded around about it, but it's Pastor John's 60th birthday today. I didn't even know if you guys would be here tonight. 
But I want to say this. I posted this on his Facebook, uh, or at least on your, what your sister posted on Facebook. But I posted this about him. I said, you know, uh, John is a true friend and a true man of God. Yeah. But you know what I respect about John more than I respect anything else? Is that I know how often John's got done preaching or teaching and felt like it went nowhere. Seasons where he was going through dryness and hard times and it would have been easier to quit than stay. But he didn't. And I, and I wrote on his Facebook today and I meant it with all my heart, I don't know where we would be without him if he had not stood. John has been one of the greatest testimonies to me of a true man of God, maybe in some ways more than anybody I've ever met in my whole life. Amen. And he is a true, humble, godly man. And, uh, you know, I, I mean that with everything in me. I mean that to be true. And I don't care what other people say about it. I'm joking. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I was a joke because he's very well respected. He's a very well-respected man, both in the church and out of the church. I'm going to close. In fact, my time's up. I'll close. The, I'll give you one more, and then we'll close tonight. Success, interestingly enough, success is a means of broken identity. Listen, a lot of people think to themselves, well, success is the proof of healed identity. No, 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 no. That's not true. There's a lot of successful people in the world that their success has been a cover for broken identity. They've hidden their brokenness. But, you know, listen, how, how broken does a man have to be to be a billionaire and still need more money? How broken is your identity when you've got billions of dollars and you're still trying to make more and you don't care who you trample to get more? I mean, that's, that's astounding to me. That, 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 you know, I think sometimes of, you know, I think sometimes of what Cindy and I could do with a million dollars for the Lord. I had a man call me today. He's a, a state guy. He's a housing specialist uh, for uh, Eastern Washington for the prison, Washington State Prison System. And, and he was asking me, he goes, how big is Timothy House? He goes, how many men can you see, uh, can you house? And I said, six, comfortably. And he said, oh, that I don't know. He said, are you planning on expanding? And I said, well, yeah. You know? And Cindy was saying this on Sunday. and She was saying, I, I know that we're going to need another Roos house. And, you know, I think of what we could do with a million dollars. You know, it doesn't go to so many people live in fear. And that's why they pack their savings accounts. And, because they live in fear. There's a fear that gripped their life. Listen, I, I'm not, I, I don't know the future, and this might come back to slap me right square in the face. But I think to myself, you know, if, if God will keep me healthy, I don't need to worry about being sick. Now, I, I know there's no predictors for that, and no, nobody knows that, and I didn't know it was going to happen to me four years ago. But all I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is we can't live in fear. We can't live, or what, what if this happens? What if that happens? You know, people pray. That's why you get on the internet and you have a sore elbow. Get on the internet. I got a sore elbow. Oh, you got elbow cancer. And it's like, hello. You know, seriously. Don't ever try to self diagnose yourself on the internet. You'll go from having a sore throat to having esophageal cancer in the same day. I, I know. I, I know. I'm dying. I know it. I, I knew it. I knew it. Come on. How many of you have ever thought? I mean, how many have done that? You guy pushed yourself on the end of it. Yes. Let, let a doctor do it. Don't do it yourself. Anyway, stand with me tonight. We'll continue this. We're going to probably be talking about identity for the next two or three weeks on Wednesday nights. I hope and pray this has ministered to you, that it spoke to you, it's helped you. And uh, I believe that if you'll hear the series through, that it will definitely speak to your heart and it will definitely speak to your life. So would you bow your heads with me, Father, tonight. We come before you tonight, Lord God. I thank you for each and every person that's here. Lord, I know that, it's, that we've had a small crowd here tonight. And, but Lord God, you're invested and interested in every single heart and life. 
Lord, you are, you're, the Bible says, where there are two or three gathered in your name, you're among them. You're not on the side looking on. You're not a spectator. You're in the midst of us tonight. Father, I believe, I believe that at Calvary, your death, your death was what was needed. Your death answers every human problem. And if it's not answering it in our life, it's because there's a misunderstanding on our part. There's something we're not seeing. There's something we're not grasping or understanding because you did all that you were going to do. Your word says that Jesus will never have to die again because his death was enough. Your death and our faith in it means that we can die to brokenness. We can die to old identity. We can die to voices. They can be silenced. We don't have to be controlled any longer by things that are lies, by a belief about ourselves that is untrue. I pray tonight that the power of the Holy Spirit would break the power of lies over our life and that your people, men and women, young and old, can walk free. They can walk free tonight in the name of Jesus. I just want real quickly, if you're here tonight and you've had voices, now that doesn't mean you're weird, that doesn't mean you're you know, you're a psychiatric problem. That's humanity. That is reality for every man or woman that was ever born. They have voices at some level in their life. Unless they know the cross of Christ and, and they've been for the most part silenced. There's a lot of us that probably battle something that is still hounding our heart. That is trying to make us believe something that is untrue and unhealthy in our life. And if that's you in any way, I'm not going to call you forward tonight. We're just going to pray right where you're at. But if that's you and you, this struck you tonight, this ministered to you, this, this hit a place in your heart and you say, Pastor, that's me. And I, and I believe that Jesus' death was enough for me. And I believe that Jesus can silence this belief about me that I've carried in my heart. And then maybe you've carried it for as long as you can remember remembering. Or maybe it came about through a relationship or it came about through a tragedy. We didn't get to that tonight. But how much tragedy, especially especially uh, sexual tragedies, unleash voices on people. And I'll tell you, if you're here tonight and that's you, maybe a relationship, maybe trials and trouble and warfare has made you believe things about yourself that are lies. And you need those things silenced because, listen, it's not the voices on the outside, it's not the enemies on the outside that are our real danger. It's the inner enemy. It's the inner enemies. The enemies nobody can see and nobody can hear but us. Those are the things that are a danger to your spirit, your soul. If that's you tonight, would you raise a hand? Because I want to pray for you just real quick. We're not going to take a lot of time. Hallelujah. Father, I come before you tonight in the majestic name of Jesus. And I was thinking today how many times that I have felt the precious person of the Holy Spirit come by this church, come by my life. Lord, I've watched you, I've watched you drape my wife's heart in your presence in our home. Lord, I've felt your presence so many times throughout my life, so many moments, and, and that's what people need tonight. They need the power of the Holy Ghost to come over their life. Lord, I pray tonight that you silence voices that have tried to carve an identity that's a lie into the life of your people. I pray tonight that, Lord God, things that people have believed that were lies would be broken. They would be broken and our lives would be shattered tonight in the name of the power of that thing would be broken tonight. I pray for truth in the lives of your sons and daughters. Lord, people here tonight that have heard a voice that's saying, I'm going to get you and, and you're never going to make it and, and your marriage isn't going to survive and your destiny's never going to happen. and You're always going to live afraid. That's a lie. We break that power in Jesus' name. Lord, we believe at Calvary you broke that thing. 
You shattered that thing. We believe that your death is our death. And tonight, by faith, we have died to those lies. Yes. A dead man doesn't hear anymore. A dead man isn't tormented anymore. Or dead in you. Colossians 3.1. Galatians 2.20. Or dead in you. Romans 6, 1 through 6. Your death is our death by faith. Yes. We believe that tonight. Amen. We believe that tonight. We believe that tonight. I speak life and freedom and healing to men and women around this church tonight. Hallelujah. I speak a new beginning tonight, Lord. A new start. A new place to stand up. A new beginning, Father. In Jesus' name, a cleansed mind. Cleansed emotions. A cleansed heart. A cleansed conscience. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, Watchman Nee said something I was thinking about this morning. He said, what does the believer have yet to do? Because of what Christ did for us. And he said, all they have to do is to praise Him. So I want you to, would you do this? Would you just thank the Lord? Thank you. Thank you. Bless you. Have a good night tonight.